Sharon, Sharon Leslie Morgan is a writer and genealogist. She is the founder of Our Black Ancestry, a peer community dedicated to African-American research and has been actively involved with coming to the table for many years. And she works very closely with our group, as many of you know. In 2019, Sharon was awarded the James Dent Walker Award from the African, the Afro-American Historical and Geneal Genealogical Society, the highest award bestowed, quote, upon a person who has exhibited distinguished accomplishments through a significant and measurable connection, con excuse me, contribution to the research documentation and or preservation of African-American history. She's a native of Chicago, but she's currently living in Knoxville County, Mississippi, where she is getting into good trouble. So we would like to hear about some of your trouble, Sharon. So welcome. Ah. Go ahead. Yeah. I'll introduce it's Tim after you. you talk. Slides okay. going here, Sharon. Well, I am glad to be with you. And you received a PowerPoint of a longer presentation that I did for coming to the table, which is useful to read because it has far more detail than what I'm going to do tonight. Tonight, I am focusing on finding linked descendants. And I'm defining that as descendants of slaveholders who want to connect with descendants of people that were enslaved and also descendants of people who were enslaved who want to connect with others of similar circumstance. So this is going to be about a 20 minute presentation. I will answer whatever questions you have at the end. And I hope I don't go too fast. I tried to condense this into 20 minutes so that it would be easy to absorb. Uh, but the presentation will be available to everyone. Prinny will send it out to all of you so that you, look at, you can look at it later. Next. Were your ancestors enslaved? A lot of people ask me this question. In 1860, 394,000 people held 4 million people in bondage. At the end of the Civil War, 4 million enslaved people were emancipated. At that time, only 10%, 400,000 people were free. So if your ancestors were born in deep Southern states prior to 1870, they were likely, more than likely, enslaved. Next. A lot of white people say, oh, I didn't know, I had no idea, I didn't think my ancestors were slaveholders, and they're kind of shocked to find that out. The truth is one in 70 people, men, were slaveholders. Most were Scots-Irish. The average slaveholding was 10 people. 80% of free adult males in the South did not own slaves, which will make many people happy. And owners of 200 or more slaves were less than 1% of the total, but they held 20 to 30% of all slaves. So you had plantation slavery where you had massive numbers of people who were enslaved, and then you had very small plots where there were less than 10. If your ancestors owned land that was too big for one family to work, they were likely slaveholders. So if you search your family and you find that they owned a thousand acres, they were likely slaveholders. Next. A basic tool if you want to do this research is that you have to have family tree software. There are many versions to choose from. This is my favorite, Roots Magic. You got to buy the family tree software and this particular one costs like about 20 bucks, but it is essential to keep track of the information and documents that you accumulate. What you will do as you proceed is build trees for both the slaveholders and the enslaved people. And that is your way of being able to keep track of the research that you have done and to eventually share it with others. Next. Did I jump ahead?
or did Sharon's internet freeze? I think she froze for a second. Sharon? Whoop, whoop. I think she might have. She probably had, jumped off so she can get try to get back on. Get back in. Every Zoom meeting needs at least one malfunction. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. I don't. I really don't know what happened there. But anyway. You research, once you get the family tree software, your research sources right now are many because a whole lot of stuff is online. It is incredible what's there. So you can get zillions of records that you can research, download, and print, and you don't even have to leave your house. So the ones that are by subscription are Ancestry.com, which has become incredibly expensive. So many people are rebelling against it. And then you have our Black Ancestry. We don't have as many records online as we do links that tell you where to go to find something. And then you have free search, which is family search. You have to sign up, but it doesn't cost you anything. And then there's always Google. You can even put in your own name and see what is happening. And then offline, we have state archives, county courthouses, libraries, historical societies, cemeteries. The tip for me is that you must do old fashioned paper research. Even if you look at things online, even if you accumulate things online, there's probably a point at which you will have to go to your home place to the courthouse. Next. Next. Okay, so the research process, and I've kind of, I've, this is, I've simplified this dramatically. A lot of it is kind of the same. So if you're researching enslaved people, you begin at your ancestral home place. You find your ancestor in the 1870 census, and then you try to track their descendants on censuses through 1940, which, the la which is the last, the most recently publicly available census. And then you support your research by finding documentation, birth, marriage, death records, and other records. It is incredibly useful to do a community study to look for people around your ancestor so that you could identify people who are related either by blood or the affinity of slavery. For slaveholders, you, same thing, begin at the ancestral home place. You find your ancestor in that location. You track their slaveholding from 1790 to 1860. And then you look for substantiating documents like slave schedules, wills, profit, probate files, and deeds. And then you must look at associated people because their wives and relatives were probably also slaveholders and also lived in that small community. And many times wives were given a dowry that included slaves or a wedding gift or, you know, something. So you got to look at the other people around them. And then the big tip is that once you start doing this research and you get enough information to have something valid to go forward, check online family trees for matches because Millions of people now have online family trees. So you need to look at those trees and see if there's a match in there. And then the other one is that there's a service called Intellius, which is really cheap, but you have to subscribe to it. And you can find living people with their addresses and personal information. Next. Census records are hugely important to the research. So the first American census was taken in 1790. It was, it's required by law and that it be taken every 10 years. And despite the ordeals that we're going through with it right now, it is a law and 
this census for this year will not be available till we are all dead. <laughs> all of the censuses show the numbers of enslaved people. They will show each, each 10 years, there are different categories, <clears throat> but mostly they'll show the head of household, the composition of the household, and they will show that there were people who were enslaved. And it may even give you ages, but there will be no names. Enslaved African Americans were documented as chattel rather than people. So we are only like ticks on a schedule or a family in 1790 had six slaves uh, and it'll tell you that they were in a certain age group, but it won't tell you exactly who they are. 1870 was the first census that recorded African Americans with surnames. And this is an image of an 1870 census for my family. And it shows my Betty Wharf, who is enslaved. And Wharf was the name of her first slaveholder. And she's living next door to the man who apparently bought her. And she ended up having 17 children with his nephew. And they lived next door to each other in 1870. In 1880, her name has changed. So as you follow the census, you will see how life conditions changed. By 1880, okay, 1870, go back to that. So 1870 is the first census that records African Americans with surnames. We're no longer a shadow, we are people. There is also 1866 post-Civil War state censuses that are sketchy but helpful uh, because in many cases they don't have surnames, but you still can look at them and see whether something is there. By 1880, many people had moved and or changed their names. Like my Betty in 1880, she's no longer a wharf. She's Gavin and she's got a bunch of kids with a bunch more kids with the white man. So you have to pay attention to those changes. In 1920, there's another big bump because a lot of people relocated during the Great Migration. Black people fled the South looking for jobs. They went North. And so you have to pay attention to the geographic movement. The 1940 census is the most recently available one. So it became available in 2012. And we're looking forward to the 1950 one uh, which is coming. All censuses, the resources at all censuses from 1790 to 1940 are available at Family Search. Next. Surnames. This is a big deal because when you are researching African Americans, we didn't have public surnames prior to 1870. Related people often took different surnames after emancipation, and many people changed their names between 1870 and 1880. It is estimated, and I actually don't agree with this. Uh-oh, go back. Sorry. Duh. I don't agree with this statistic. But it is said that 15, only 15% 15 of African Americans took the name of their last slave owner. Others chose names of a previous owner, the first owner, someone they admired, a skill they possessed, an aspiration. Some merely made up a name that they liked. My best girlfriend in high school was named Rhonda Best, and her daddy said that they named themselves the best because they were the best. So you never know. One thing is for sure. African Americans did not leave Africa with European names first or last. So the big tip is when you look at 1870 in particular, do a line by line census read because when you push the button on ancestry or family search and you put in a name, you will not necessarily get back what you want. So you go to the target community and remember these communities were pretty small in those days and you look through the entire census line by line, and you look for family groups, you look at neighbors, you check neighboring counties, and that will help you reconstruct a picture of what uh, enslavement and relationships were like at that time. Next. 
finding the slaveholder. So this is a little, this is a trick that we use. It's called the Nettie rule. So you go to the 18th, you find your ancestor. If you're black, you find your ancestor in the 1870 census. And you look for people who have the surname, you look for, you try to find your particular ancestor. And then you want to go, you want to look for people with a surname that you're interested in. So from that name of your ancestor, you go 10, up, 10 households up, forward pages, 10 households back. And if you find a white person with that same surname, they are the likely last slaveholder. And this works all the time. Once you find the likely slaveholder, then you have to research his family in order to prove the connection. So hopefully there'll be a will, a deed, a court case, something that will substantiate it. So the Nettie rule works. You could also look at it from the other point of view for a white person descendant of a slaveholder, find your ancestor in 1870, look 10 back, 10 forward, and see if there are black people with that name and those people were likely enslaved by your ancestor. Next. Slave schedules. People don't know that these exist. Every census, as I said earlier, documented slave holdings, but there were separate schedules produced in 1850 and 1860. These, the one for 1860 is particularly important because that's the, that's the one right before the 1870 one where black people ended up having surnames. And when you look at them, there are no names. There is only a tick for male, female, uh, black, mulatto, a description, male, female, uh, and age. So you can only guess whether these connect to you, but they are useful to get the scope of family slaveholding and to at least be able to make some educated guesses. So this is my, these are my white people. And you see their names there. So one of these people is my great, my two times great grandmother. And I think that she is the one in 1860 who is a 20-year-old female and there's a child who is a mulatto child. So you also should note the entries for slave houses in 1860 because those might indicate family groups. So when you see a, an indication, it'll, you see these little numbers here like 533, three, those are slave houses. So the average inha inhabitants of a slave house was anywhere from six to 12. So this might be able to help you reconstruct a family. Uh, the 1850 schedule, it'll also tell you if somebody, if they were fugitives, uh, if they were idiotic. So there's a lot of information you can get from these. The slave schedules are all available on family search. But what you, what, and what you do is you pull up Google in 1850 slave schedule family search and you will find the, the whole of slave schedules for that particular community. And those are incredibly useful. Next. Deeds. Okay, I did this little sarcastic thing on the left. This was a wedding gift from Sylvester Dunn to Mary Gavin, who was the matriarch of the white man who fathered my ancestors. <coughs> so this is not the child that is named in the document, but that's what she might have looked at, looked like. They would have dressed her up and said, okay, now you going, <coughs> she's getting ready to be Mary Gavin's gift. So that's little Nancy, a small girl of dark complexion. And you will find many of these. When you look at the deed books and you will only see these in the courthouses because most of them have not been digitized. You go to the index, you look for deeds prior to 1865 and you will see where people, enslaved people were gifts, they were mortgaged, 
they were thrown in as a little uh, lanyap when you bought property. There were many ways of transacting, but these are incredibly important. Next. Probate records. Enslaved people were often bequeathed in wills, mortgaged, and sold to satisfy debts. Again, these are records that are generally not digitized. However, many of them now are, thanks to family search. So when a person dies, if they write a will, there's a whole process that attends to that, if they write a will or not. You write a will, it gets recorded in the courthouse, and then it has to be accounted for every year until your estate is settled. So if the estate goes on for a very long time, which in my situation it did, there's a report every year of what happened to the people, to the property, equal people who were enslaved. So I have 20 years worth of tracking of people who started off in a will and ended up in the possession of the child one of the sons of the, the man who was the patriarch. So these are called, their estate files. They include these inventories and an annual distribution report. At the end of the process, there is an estate settlement, which means that slaves were either sold or they were transferred or they were otherwise, quote, disposed of. So you have to look at those whole files and all of that is very sketchy about what is online, but these are incredibly useful. You see the names of the enslaved people on my sample here and their value. Next, personal papers. This is another one because we're not aware of many of these papers, but the resource is that Jean Cooper who was a librarian at the Library of Virginia, she created an index to records of antebellum Southern plantations. So she has a book that lists all of the antebellum plantations of which she is aware. And it is indexed according to the name of the slaveholder, the name of the plantation, and the name of the people that are included in the records. So these can be incredibly useful. And this is just a fraction of what is actually available because now there's so much more, but these are really good. For the Hairston family uh, of Virginia, well, they had nine plantations in four states. And with one of their descendants, I found a treasure trove at the University of North Carolina, boxes and boxes and boxes of material. So these are incredible. Next. After slavery, there was the Freedmen's Bureau. So it was established and it was supposed to help emancipated slaves uh, negotiate their new lives as, as free people. So many formerly enslaved people worked as sharecroppers for their former masters and they signed contracts. And in these contracts, you will often find not just the name of the person you're looking for, but there can be a lot of family detail and you never know. This is a really simple one that didn't have a lot, but this is my family in Knoxville County, Mississippi. And the slaveholder was actually in Madison. So these are important. You can, the resource is freedmansbureau.com and you can go there and look. There are cases where an enslaved, a formerly enslaved person might complain I worked the land and she didn't pay me. Or I worked the land and he threw me off. So these can be really good. And this recently, in the last two years, huge parts of this uh, document cache were put online. Next. Newspapers. Newspapers are really important, mostly Black people weren't recorded in newspapers unless they did something really bad. But you will find community news, which will help you give, a, give you context on the, on the community that you're looking at. There are obituaries, mostly of white people, but there are some that are our good old darky. 
there are fugitive slave ads and there are find my people ads for people who were searching for their relatives after emancipation. So in these two, you see Thomas Jefferson posted an ad, Prinny, about a runaway from the subscriber. And he's looking for a mulatto slave called Sandy and <laughs> describes him. So these are really useful. And then in the top one, that is my ancestor. Owen oh, Gavin blew his head off with a shotgun after dividing a dollar amongst his 15 children. So those are the kinds of things that you will find. The absolute best resource is Chronicling America, which is a compendium of digitized images from thousands of historic newspapers. Next. DNA testing. People today are jumping to DNA like lemmings off a cliff <laughs> because that's going to be the answer. And I don't agree with that. There are two very good tests on the market, Ancestry and Family Tree DNA. But I really have this position that you need to do the paper research first so that you know who to test. Don't just jump out there and do a test because they will give you thousands of connections and you have no idea how they relate to you. So who to test? The person that will solve your puzzle. In my case, this applies. 10% of enslaved people were recorded in 1870 as mulatto. So you're looking for white fathers. So when in my doing my research in Knoxville County, I'm trying to prove a white Gavin was the father of my ancestor, of my several ancestors, 17 of them. So I tested the person that would make that possible for me to figure that out. And I did prove it. But that is a very specific goal. And I think that is what you need to have. There's an excellent book called The Social Life of DNA race reparations and reconciliation after the genome by Alondra Nelson. That is a really good book to read in order to understand what the genealogy test can and cannot do and how they apply in particular to connections with African-Americans. Next. There are two types of tests. One, well, there are three types. There's a Y DNA, which is a male test. Man, man, man. My father, his father, his father, his father, his father. And then there's an empty DNA, which is female, mother. My mother, 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 mother. So those are straight line tests, and those are the ones that usually solve your issue. So if you want to find the father of someone, you need a white male who is in that family line, and you need a black person who you believe is in that family line and they need to test and you need to compare. On the female test, most of the enslaved, let's see, enslaved ch children inherited the status of their mother and rape was so rampant that you are more likely to find results on the female line because being able to prove the mother is actually easier than being able to prove the father. Because remember, we're relying on people being alive to be able to test and compare. So when you look at the mother, that is the line that is more likely to take you back to Africa. And it is the line that is more likely to connect you to the slaveholding family. Next. Next, and then there's the autosomal DNA test, and that is the everybody test. So that's the one where you get thousands of results, and they are supposed to go back at least five generations, but you have to figure out how they fit. So you can do male and female testers. It shows inheritance from all ancestral lines, and just remember that how DNA gets divided over time so that's what you'll get. 
You also have to remember that the ethnicity estimates are based on reference populations. So as an example, Native Americans generally do not take DNA tests. So if you think that you are Native American, you probably won't get results because they just don't test. And the tests depend on them having a pool of DNA samples in order to match you to it. So a lot of people think that they're Native American and you can't prove it, not because you're not, but because the samples don't exist. And now my cat is gonna walk back and forth in front of me. Okay, next, next. <laughs> I just in time to Isn't wind you up. Itty bitty, pretty kitty. <laughs> my Ingo, I have been doing this for most of my life. And if any of you have read my book, you know about the journey. And there are still things, healing takes forever. So there are still things that I'm very conflicted about. But I live in, my, in the home place of my ancestors now. And I am doing my best to use the knowledge that I have to make this community a better, more enlightened place. So my goal in all of the things that I do, including this presentation, I want us to use genealogy as a tool for healing. I want people to open their hearts and build bridges. I have worked with several people in coming to the table to help them find linked ancestors and it had incredibly successful results. I have never had a black person say, I don't wanna connect with you, which is a, uh, when you, why, why are white people so afraid? Okay, it's like, you <laughs> just reach out. We're the ones who sing Amazing Grace. You know, we forgive people instantly. So it is not the ordeal that you may think that it is. And the information that you have can be incredibly valuable to someone. So you gotta open your heart, you gotta build bridges. And we have to use what we learn to pursue restorative justice. It is not about being angry. It is not about getting even. It is not about doing to white people what they did to us. It is about building a better society and trying to use the past in order to be a lantern for the future. Because we wanna transform done wrong to done right. So the founding premise for coming to the table was Dr. King's statement that I have a dream that one day, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, and I will say sons and daughters, will be able to sit together at a table of brotherhood. So that's what we're trying to do here. And I hope that this has been helpful and I will welcome any questions. And thank you very much. Woohoo! Way to go, Sharon. Now, we, if you'll hold your questions, we're gonna hold them till the end after Tim. Let me go right to Tim and introduce him because we wanna give him plenty of time. And that was sensational, Sharon. Thank you. Let me put my glasses on. They're not as good as yours, but they'll do. <laughs> Okay, folks, Tim Kilby has been doing family genealogical research for over 40 years. He's a member of the Fairfax, Virginia Genealogical Society, the Virginia Genealogical Society, and the National Genealogical Society. He's also a member of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society and has published in its professional journal. Tim has made many formal presentations. He's talked to the Fairfax Genealogical Society and the African American Special Interest Group of that society. And Tim has been involved in the uh, GEDCOM X project to update data exchange specifications and metadata tags supporting the unique needs of African American genealogy. So over to you, Tim. Oh, that last credential, I think, probably would take a little explanation, but uh, we'll save that for another time. Uh, I, I need to uh, begin by just uh, thanking Sharon so much for her presentation and to, to really emphasize how important it is to follow all of those suggestions that she's laid out. You have to do the genealogy first before... Uh, uh, before you're going to do some of the, the, the more advanced uh, methods of, of uh, 
disco- discovering your link descendants. I've got two things that I'd like to talk about very, very quickly tonight. One of them is about DNA. And another one is a kind of a strange way of finding some information from church records that will help you in your, in your genealogical research. Uh, Sharon has already gone over the, the types of DNA that, uh, that can be tested or that should be tested. Autosomal DNA is the one that uh, we're all familiar with. We see ads on television all the time from Ancestry and from 23andMe and Family Tree DNA and other companies. So uh, that's the one we're kind of familiar with. And I'll go over some of the details about that. The other two tests are a little bit uh, less familiar. The Y DNA test for the male Y chromosome is more of a specialized test, but it certainly has its purposes in the work that we do. And then the microchondrial DNA or mtDNA, which tests the, the female line of, of our ancestors. And uh, it can be used as well to provide some very valuable information. Emphasizing once again, you must do the traditional genealogy in order that you can put some names to the things that you can discover through, uh, through your DNA test. Next slide. So autosomal DNA, uh, I've got five generations here, or six if you count yourself, going back to your great-great-great-great-great-grandparents, of which you've got 32 of them. You've got males, you've got females, and you get autosomal, or you may get autosomal DNA, bits of autosomal DNA, from all of these people that you see on this, on this chart. Uh, however, because of the whole process, the scientific process of, of recombination, you get less and less and less smaller and smaller bits of DNA from each of those subsequent generations. So it's possible for uh, you know, two siblings, a brother and a sister or two brothers, to be, have totally different DNA showing, uh, you know, one may show some DNA that comes from a great, great grandfather and another one may not have any from that, that same individual. So you can't always predict that you're gonna be uh, getting the same amount of DNA from each, autosomal DNA from each of those ancestors. The other fact to, to remember is that brothers and sisters or two brothers, unless they are identical twins, they're gonna have different DNA and they will, they will be a, a little bit different in each case. Next slide. So with y, with y chromosome, only the males inherit that Y chromosome. So if, since I'm a male, uh, I inherited the, some Y DNA from my father and he inherited it from his grandfather and from his grandfather to his great grandfather or from my great grandfather and so on, all the way back, perhaps, you know, tens, twenties, hundreds of generations unchanged or with only very, very minor changes. So we can trace that direct paternal lineage back through that Y DNA. And it can be very useful in, in a paternity of people that we that we want to uh, identify as our linked descendants. The same or the similar is, do, is true with mitochondrial DNA, the MT DNA. Whereas uh, males inherit the uh, mitochondrial DNA from their mother, but uh, females do not inherit the Y DNA from their father. Females inherit uh, the mitochondrial DNA from their mother going all the way back in time for multiple generations, way, way past the great, great grandmother. But I want you to remember that as you see on this chart, both brother and sister, we also inherit uh, autosomal DNA from these same relatives. So we inherit autosomal from everybody that you see on this chart, and we inherit Y DNA. If we're a male, we inherit Y DNA from our paternal line, and we inherit mitochondrial DNA from our maternal line. Um, so next slide. So here's a part of my uh, a tree that I'd like to help explain how I was able to identify some of my linked descendants using DNA. Remember that uh, all of our ancestors, all of our uh, great great grandfathers and our great great grandparents, they all had multiple children. So this tree that you're seeing here is only a very small portion of a family tree. It does not show you all the collateral lines of the aunts and uncles and the, and the, and the uh, descendants of those great aunts and uncles that you would have. 
But if you follow, follow this chart here, I'm the little blue mark in the, in the middle there that says me, and I can trace my ancestors back to my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather, all the way back to my great-great-grandfather, which is the little square marked number one. And his name was Leroy. And his father, my great-great-great-grandfather, was named James Kilby. And my great-great-grandfather, Leroy, he had multiple siblings. I only show one of those sibling, siblings on this chart. He is the, um, the male in position number two. His name was Thomas Kilby. And Thomas married a woman named Melinda Hawkins, and she became Melinda Kilby. She's the little white circle that's right beside the square number two. And Thomas and Melinda were enslavers. And they enslaved a woman that's shown in position number eight there. Her name was Sarah. And Sarah, in 1834, she had a daughter. Her daughter's name was Juliet. Juliet is shown on this chart in position number four. Now Thomas uh, and Melinda had nine children. I show only three sons on this chart, but there were other sons and there were other daughters in that family. But the three sons were important to my genealogical research. One of those sons in position number three, and we don't really know precisely the name of that individual, but we know that he was one of the sons of Thomas. Uh, he grew up to be a father of the, the, the children of Juliet. He became the biological father of her children. Juliet had five children that are shown there, three sons and two daughters. Thomas had died in 1834, so he was out of the picture by then. But his son was, was living and he fathered a number of children, at least we suspected. And how could DNA help prove that he was the father? Well, I did the research and genealogical research. I was able to discover all of the descendants of all the children of Juliet and And there were three sons and two daughters. And so I, on this chart, I only show three lines of that family. But if we follow the, the line down to the, this on the left of, 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 uh, of Juliet Ann, down to position number five, position number five is a male who it happens to be my fourth cousin once removed. He's a younger man than I am. And his he's a Kilby, and his father, and his father, uh, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather were all named Kilby. So I could see that he was a male that could be on this same family line. So which test, which DNS tip, DNA test would I want to use to see if he was a descendant of my great, great, great grandfather, James Kilby, all the way at the top of the chart. Well, it's a continuous male line. So I would use the Y DNA test to test to see if he is a member of the family. And in fact, he was. Number five, that fourth cousin once removed has identical Y DNA to me over on the other part of the chart. So we were able to prove that the uh, son of Thomas Kilby in position number three, one of those sons was the father of that line of family. Now a second line of family, which were all males going down from Juliet Ann goes down to position number six, a female. I could not use Y DNA test to, to find out if she also was on that same line but we can use autosomal DNA in this case. And the, the fourth cousin once removed at position number six, this female, and there are actually multiples in this position, used autosomal DNA to, to, to connect through that great, great, great grandfather and connect to other Kilbys, other white Kilbys uh, on the family, family line. So we we're able to prove using autosomal DNA that she, number six there, is a true Kilby cousin. Number seven is a very interesting one because number seven, a female, her father was not in the Kilby line, but her mother was, and her grandmother, and her great-grandmother, and her great-great-grandmother, and her great-great-great-grandmother was Juliet Ann. We, find, we know that through the genealogy that I conducted to trace this family line all the way down to a living descendant. 
which DNA test would I use in this situation? Of course, autosomal DNA is useful here to see if she's connected to any white Kilby's. But also, since it's a continuous female line, she was, she was interested in doing the uh, uh, mitochondrial mtDNA test. And she did that, and she discovered that her family line, her, her matrilineal family line, goes all the way back to Sarah, number eight taught here, and to Sarah's grandmother, who that, who, uh, Sarah's mother and grandmother, whoever they were, we don't know their names, but we're able to determine what their genealogical haplotype is. That is a distinctive um, uh, um, label for a family line that traces all the way back. And her family line was, uh, the haplogroup was called L32A, which is a haplogroup uh, originating in Nigeria. So we're able to find a lot more information about that family line and about the ancestry and probably the origin of of the, uh, the family lines of, of uh, Juliet Ann, number four, and Sarah, number eight. So a lot can be, t can be discovered through using um, all three types of DNA. Now, when you go online and you, and you do a DNA test, you're gonna get lots and lots of matches. And you need to do that, that uh, uh, intensive genealogical research to try to sort out some of these names work with those matches to help them with their genealogical tree to see if you can identify how these connections are made. Next slide. So another, another important area for, for my research is discovering who the, who the uh, enslavers were for uh, the, the people that were part of a, of a community that was a church community that, um, that was part of my family. And I can use church records uh, that were uh, records prior to the Civil War to find out the names of people that were enslavers and also the names of people that were part of that same congregation, black people that were members of that church that, uh, that had names that we can, we can associate with their enslavers. Next slide. Now, Thomas and Melinda Kilby lived on a plantation near Culpeper, Virginia, Culpeper County, in Culpeper County, Virginia. That is this little cabin that's located in the center of this slide. The, the red circles that surround that represent one mile uh, uh, different distances. And so if I wanted to find out well, where did they go to church, what was the denomination that, was, that they were um, part of, and were any of the people that they enslaved part of that same congregation, then I first need to identify the churches that they, they perhaps went to. So I drew the, I pulled out an old map. Uh, this is an 1864 map, which lists uh, the places where a lot of the churches at that time uh, uh, were located. And I located on this same map all of the different churches that, that could possibly be the, uh, the, the church where Thomas and Melinda went to church. Now, Thomas died in 1864. So prior to that time, I needed to look at only churches that existed in that early, eight, early time. And one of those churches was in position number one up there. It's called the Gordvine uh, Church. But when he died, it was too far for Melinda to go by herself or for her to take her, her young children or to take any people that she had enslaved. To, to that same church. So she had to find a different church. And there was another church that had started just at that, in that same year, 1834. That's the church that's in position number two there called New Salem Baptist Church. Now she was a widow as of 1834 and she remained a widow all the way up till 1865, 31 years. At that time, uh, she remarried, and she remarried a man named Bluford Thornhill. And Bluford Thornhill, you need to remember that name, uh, he had a plantation that's that little cabin over in the lower left. And he went to church at FT Church. And that's the church in, in position number three. Uh, next slide, or next. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to look at the church records for those three churches to see what I could find. 
I did look at the church records for Gourd Vine Baptist Church, and I found out that Melinda and, and Thomas Kilby were members of that church. They were baptized there in 1832, but he died just a couple of years later. So that's all the records that I could find there. Next slide. Where would I find church records? Well, they're typically, you can find many of them in state archives or perhaps with the church itself. These three churches that I mentioned are all in existence today. So I would want to contact those churches to see where are your records kept? And some of those records were down at the Library of Virginia, part of the Virginia archives. And I could go to Richmond and look at, the, look at some of those records, which I did. And I found that, this, that the, the records that I really wanted to, to look at were not there. They were subsequent records and I needed to go somewhere else. And so I did discover that those records were held at the Virginia Baptist Historical Society, also in Richmond, which houses just a full library of just church records, at least for the state of Virginia. Next slide. So looking at those church records, I discovered that there were membership lists in those records. There were uh, maybe a dozen pages full of records for the white membership of that church, both male and female. And then I came across four pages full of records for the African-American members of that same church. Uh, just click forward, please. This is what it looks like up, up close. Now this is, this is in the volume two of this church, which kept records all the way up from, 18, six, from 1855 up to uh, 1878. That was a, a long span of time. But in 1855, they kept records that looked like this. In the far left column, you see the names of people that were enslavers. And then just to the right of that, you see the names of people that they enslaved. Only the first name, of course. In addition to that, we see other information on this slide. We see baptismal dates. A lot of people were baptized on November the 7th in 1860. In addition to those uh, notes, we also see over on the right, we see additional information about those same individuals. We see uh, notes of people that were deceased, and even in some cases, the dates at which they were deceased. We see information about people that were excluded from the membership. Exclusion was something that was somewhat rare, but it was very important to the church because the people had uh, violated some infraction of the church rules and that they were excluded from the membership. In some cases, they were restored back after a period of time. And you'll see a note that says restored. And so they came back into the membership. And in other cases, you'll see it's some notes that would say dismissed by letter and a date. That means that that individual uh, went to a different church. Perhaps the, the enslaver took that individual to another church or they left and became, had a new owner that was a part, of a part of a new church. Next slide. In 1866, the church found it necessary to make a new list of the African-American members of that church. And there were three full pages of names. Click. Next. Here's what that, that list looked like on January the 13th of 1866 and in subsequent years when they added some new information as it became available. So now the important thing is the, the black community that's part of this church, the membership now have surnames. We have Prince Mary, who was baptized in 1838. He was dismissed from the church, went to a different church in 1876. That's about the same time as the end of Reconstruction. So he may have gone to a new church it was a black church formed about that same time. And it, leaving at the same time was a woman named Jane Mary. I don't know what their relationship was, but that would certainly be something worth investigating. I can also see other names of people down here and groups of people that were, that were baptized on certain dates uh, and certain people that were excluded from the membership, uh, other people that uh, have dates of, of uh, being de uh, deceased. So this is very valuable, valuable information, but most importantly, we have surnames for at, at, this, uh, at this time. Those exclusions, by the way, are very interesting if you look in the minutes that are part of the same volumes of, of books, because you find out why were they ex excluded. 
And there's an interesting story about Juliet Milton and Louisa Staling, those two women who were um, baptized on September the 17th of 1865. A very interesting story as to why one of them was excluded. And it has uh, implications for my family. Next slide, please. So if we compare the early list to the latter list, then we start to match up people from the 1866 list to the earlier list and identify the enslaver that was of record in that church um, you know, in earlier times. That person may not have been the last enslaver or it may not have been the first enslaver, but at some point in time, that person was an enslaver. On the early list, for example, we have six people that were all baptized on October the 12th, 1862. Of those, there are two of, of quite of interest. There's an uh, Eliza, and in the 1866 list, or, and thereafter, we see a woman named Eliza Griggs, who was also um, baptized on October 12th, 1862, and deceased in 1874. Well, is that just a coincidence? Or should we say that the woman that's named Eliza on the early list is the same as the one that's on the latter list? Very likely so. And the one on the early list was enslaved by Sarah Kilby, my great-great-grandmother. Also on that list, we see a man named Albert. In the latter list, he has a surname, Albert Smallwood. Same uh, baptismal date. And he has been, uh, the note is that he's transferred to a new book. So volume two ends in 1878. So that means that he was a member after 1878. He continued to be a member of this church. Next slide. Here's another selection. We have uh, numbers of people uh, on the earlier list then, uh, that have um, baptismal dates of September the 17th of 1865. And then if we looked at the latter list, we see two people that have those same uh, dates of, of baptismal, Juliet Milton and Louisa Staling. Well, on the earlier list, we have a Juliet, and she was enslaved by a man named B. Thornhill. That's Bluford Thornhill. That's the new husband of Melinda Kilby. And when Melinda died, when, excuse me, when Melinda remarried in 1865, her property then became the property of Bluford Thornhill. So here is Juliet, the uh, original daughter of, of Sarah, born in 1834, listed in the church records as, the, as uh, a member. Uh, well, if you read it, uh, baptized in September of 1865, she's a free person at this time, but she's still listed without a surname as if she were still the property of Bluford Thornhill. Uh, and then there's Lucy Staling also, and she was excluded. And, and um, once again, if I read the minutes, I find an interesting story about why she was, why she was excluded uh, and, and how, her, how she was associated with Juliet. Now, Juliet had multiple children. They were all too young to be members of the church at this time. The oldest was only 15. So he wouldn't have been a member, and he wouldn't, would not have been listed in the church records. Next slide. If I looked at all of the members of the church uh, that were African-American in 1866, there were nine, 96 individuals. And I put those names in a database. And then I look back at the 1855 list, and I tried to match up all of the data that I could mine from these records, match them up with, a, with an enslaver. Of those 96, I could fairly positively identify 36 of the enslavers of those individuals. And of those 36, how many of them do you think took the last name of their enslaver? The answer is zero. They all had new names. They all had new surnames. And if I were doing my genealogical research and going back through 1870 records, how would I go back go and find the name of an enslaver who had a different surname. Well, Sharon, you had great ideas there about using uh, the census records to look forward on the census records and look back and try to associate families that way. This is another method 
of trying to associate a, uh, a person after the Civil War, after emancipation, and with a new surname with the enslaver beforehand. So it works for, for us that are white people that are trying to find the names of people that, were, that our ancestors enslaved and find the names that they, they used after uh, emancipation and after they took new surnames. And it also works for people that are black people that are looking for the names of their enslaver so they can trace those white families to, to try to make connections on that side of the family too. Next slide. Now in 1878, there was a new church in the area. This is Nazareth Baptist Church. And I've drawn circles around it and then located all the white churches that were there in that area. And we can, we can probably guess that a lot of the members of that new church, that new African-American church came from white churches. And so if I'm doing research and I'm going back and finding my, my uh, ancestor, my black ancestor uh, at a particular church, I want to look at all the white churches that were near there and look at the, look at the records of those white churches to try to trace back further in time. I think that's the end slide, so thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. I'm going to turn it over to Prinny, and she's going to handle the Q&A from there. From okay, here. let me track back through the chat and see what I can find. Um, so let's see. A question that I can answer is yes, we will be sharing the PowerPoint. So if you missed a reference or you missed the title of a book, it'll be there. Um, we got the social life of DNA. A lot of thank yous to Sharon, Sharon. Thank you. A comment about church records in New England. Um, so I think this is a question for you, Sharon. If you use a software like Roots Family Magic, is it easy to download your records from Ancestry and add records from other sources? Yes. The most popular software programs are the one sponsored by Ancestry, which is Family Tree, and then Roots Magic. I actually turned off on Family Tree because they had this glitch in 2012 that was like incredible and made me lose all my records. So I've switched to Roots Magic. They allow you to research online and download the documents into your tree so that you can share. Because the point is that you want to make the tree, download everything you have, and eventually upload it, probably to Family Search, where people can find it. So yes, they have that facility. Okay. Um, and Tim, here's a question for you. What was the name of the organization that houses all those Virginia church records? Well, many of them are located at the National, excuse me, at the Virginia State Archives. Uh, and available through the Virginia Library. You have to go into their archives room and request a particular uh, document, but they have copies. Most of them are, them are photostatic copies of the original records. The originals are typically housed with the, uh, uh, with the Virginia Baptist, in, in my case, the, our family were Baptists, so they're located at the Virginia Baptist uh, Historical Society, which is located on the campus of the University of Richmond in Richmond. Other denominations keep records as well. The Methodists, they also kept good records. Um, I can't speak for other denominations and, or for other states, but I know that uh, records are, are typically kept uh, um, at, at these, uh, uh, the older records are kept at the different archives. Some churches did not keep really good records. So you may not find the kinds of rich resources that I found at this particular church. 
Um, but if you're lucky, there's, there will be there, and it's certainly worth the effort to, uh, to hunt them out and to, and to see if you can find those particular uh, documents and those records. Thank you. Here's a question that um, is probably for you, Sharon. The person says, I'm Black, and I find ancestors listed in the 1860 census. Does that mean that ancestor was a free man? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, this might be for either one of you. Um, all my information is before 1800. Is the best tactic to track the information that far back? I think that question is saying sort of fill in the gap. Well, yeah, what I was saying is that if for a slaveholding family, you should track back to 1790, which is the first American census. And as I said, all the censuses list who were slaveholders. And I think it is important to get a grasp on the scope of your family slaveholding. So I think that it is important to track them all the way from 1790 to 1860. Okay. I certainly would agree with that. Uh, uh, I found out that personal tax records for in a state uh, Absolutely. in, in, in 17, 1790 and, and in some cases 1800, also include names of the enslaved. So they're worth, worth uh, looking at. I don't think that that was a universal practice, however. It but was I think not it's a universal yeah. practice, but that is absolutely a good lead. Yeah, and certainly I would trace as far back as, as one can uh, into the 18th century uh, to, to look for a family, personal records, to see if there are ledgers uh, you may be able to identify, uh, you know, the, the, the original person that was uh, purchased off a of slave ship, for example. I mean, it's possible to do that and, and then to try to trace a family's uh, individuals uh, forward in time. So it's well worth you, uh, following every lead that you possibly can. It is necessary because of the format that we have abbreviated, both Tim and I, there is a vast collection of resources. Mm -hmm. And in this short amount of time that we have, it is very hard to give you everything. So I think that we've tried to do the top line of a way to go forward with your research. But there are so many other things that you can look at, like the church records. People don't think about those, but those are hugely rich. People have Bible records. Mm -hmm. Those are hugely rich. You know, it is uh, the tax records, hugely rich. So as you, I, don't, I hate to say this word, as you go down the rabbit hole, there is just so much there. Thank you. And I think this question might be for both of you as well. If my sisters and my linked descendant have had their DNA tested through Ancestry and they were not a match, does that mean conclusively that we are not biological relatives? No. Was not As Tim conclusive. explained, DNA is, okay, DNA, uh, it's, I don't have the word. It, it's more uh, use. It is okay. random. Yeah. It is like you have no idea which percentage you get from mother, father, other people. So even people who are sisters, unless you are identical, it does not say that you are not related if you don't get the same result. So, and that's part of what is confusing because people are jumping to the DNA and they're not doing the, the 
paper research in order to make the track that you can prove. So you have, you just really have to be careful about that. I have a sister. Okay. My, I am, I am my father's only child. My sister is her father's only child. We have the same mother. So when we do our DNA, the results are really different. It would say we're not related at all, but we are. So that's why you have to be really careful about how you do this. And the paper trail, the old fashioned, dig it up paper trail is the best way to start. And then use the DNA to prove your mysteries. I'm going to absolutely uh, agree with everything that you're saying, Sharon. The, the thing that we should remember is that, you know, the, the common link in most of our cases is four, five, six generations back. Yes. And when you get that far back, you've got, a, theoretically, you've got 3%, 1% chance of, of having some matching DNA. But because right, of the random re recombination, the yes, you, yeah, because of recombination, it's hit or miss. You may not have received any DNA from that particular relative, that common relative, and your in your and your match may not have received any DNA from that that common ancestor. But traditional genealogy is the best way of forming those links and to and use DNA as a as a possible uh, confirmation of that uh, DNA, but it certainly is not going to, to rule out that, uh, uh, th that you are in fact related. Okay, there's some good information in the chat. I will um, save the chat and share it afterwards. So some of the additional information people are providing will be available to you. Um, here's a question. Uh, probably for you, Sharon, could a reference in a 1798 deed to, to quote, two creatures known by name of Pullen and Sal, unquote, refer to enslaved people? The family did not have enslaved people in the 1790 census, nor in the 1800 census. So where is it, where are these names coming from? Uh, in a deed, a 1798 deed in between yeah. these two censuses. My instant judgment would be that those were enslaved people. Okay. I'm going to use an example, uh, Tom DeWolf, who I wrote my book with. They had a, a poem even about polyd um, what is it, Amador and Polydor, mm -hmm. and they are buried in the DeWolf family plot in Rhode Island, and they came from Africa, and people couldn't s understand what that rhyme was about, but they were enslaved people and so from the reference you were giving me without any other context, I would say, yes, they were enslaved and you need to look further. Okay, and I think this is probably also a question for you, Sharon. It's a question about probate records, the annual distribution report. How do I find those records? My last slaveholder died after 1870. Okay, many probate files lasted beyond slavery. So, if the person died before 1865, their estate could have carried forward. So their estate file will still be useful to you because it would include all the old references. So you need to look at the entire thing. Like I told you, there's a process. You file a will, you, uh, they do an inventory, they pay off the debts, and then they reach a final estate settlement. So in my own family situation, 
the man, the white man died in 1825 and he willed his property to his wife. As long as she didn't get married and then it would go to his children. So she didn't get married for many years, many, many, for like 25 years. She didn't never remarry. So when she died, there was a final estate settlement that did not happen until after 1865. But that record still remains because every year they record what is in this, the estate. So you really do have to look at those. And you won't add, find them online. This is something <laughs> you'll find in the courthouse. I'll add that, uh, you know, when people died, uh, family members quite often argued among themselves and they challenged wills. No shit. <laughs> yeah. And those, those records tip, typically ended up in a, a, a court of equity, sometimes called chancery courts. And those are just so rich records. They tell you all about Ooh. what went on. You find wills there. You find uh, letters uh, arguing, uh, you know, this, that, and the other about who should uh, uh, inherit this property and who should inherit that property. Always check uh, chancery uh, court records. In Virginia, luckily, we have all of those records online. And you can go into the Library of Virginia, their site, and look, at, look for chancery records and find out uh, all of the chancery records. They had been uh, originally microfilmed and they're all digitized and online now. Um, don't ignore those records. Um, here's a question that, well, part of it is within what you were saying, part of it may be a little outside um, and it's for both of you. Do you have any advice for finding records related to free black communities formed during the colonial period and native communities? Are there any archives that you could recommend for finding those records? Uh, the one thing I will say is that if you track your ancestor back on the census and you find them prior to 1870, which means they were a free person, you, you start there. And I had a case recently that was remarkable because the family had never been enslaved. And so they were documented in all of the censuses before 1870 as free people. So I get that is the first step that you would do. Uh, and it is very difficult and very different. Difficult and different. Uh, but yeah, I mean, free people were free people, black or white. So, you know, you have to, you just have to go back and look at those records. And my light just died, so I can't <laughs> let it illuminate it. Uh-oh. I'll give you one, uh, one resource that I found. Uh, you know, a, a number of my uh, uh, Kilby cousins married into a family named Timbers. And so I wanted to research that family as well. And they, they were all free, free people of color all the way back to the, ninth, to the, uh, to the 18th century. Uh, but in, in researching them, I also discovered, at least in the county that I was looking at, that the county kept records back in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s of all free people in the county because the courts had to issue papers to them that they, in fact, were free people. Mm. Free people needed to carry papers with them to prove that they were free. Uh, and so the court records uh, that were that are part of, at least in this instance, there there are court records that identified them, it gave full descriptions, you know, of, of these individuals, uh, and and uh, identified them as free people so that they would uh, be uh, issued the proper papers to carry with them. What often happened is that once, if you became free, not only did you have to carry your papers but 
I mean, you could be challenged any day, any by anybody, to prove that you were free. And it was in order to stay in the state of Virginia, if you could not, uh, you had to have a bond, you had to leave within 12 months. I mean, there were, uh, the big word is code noir, the black codes so that you had to, if you became free, because slaveholders were very worried that enslaved people would be inspired by people who are free, that you had to leave the premises. So there's a very uh, convoluted and difficult history about that. But the US Census actually will document if people were free, they were listed in the census as free. And Thank like you. I said, that was 10% of the population in 1870. Thanks. Uh, Tim, I think this is at least starts with you. This person says, I have thousands of autosomal DNA connections and thousands of mtDNA hits. And there seems to be no overlap between the two. Does this make sense? I'm sorry. I, you have autosomal DNA matches and you have AT DNA hits? MT. Mitochondrial oh, MT. DNA. MT DNA okay. hits. Uh, and no overlaps between autosomal and mitochondrial. Well, I would not say that anything other than I would be suspicious that, you know, the people were testing at different companies. The the hits were at one place and not the other. Uh, and people don't always test, you know, both types of DNA. You know, there are many people that test one or the other uh, and not both. So um, without looking at some specifics, I don't know that I could uh, see a pattern there that I could identify. Okay. Thank you. And um, here's another question for you, Tim. Um, do you think... Virginia compiled genealogies is a worthwhile and reputable resource. I must admit I'm not familiar with that, uh, that resource. What is that again? Um, Virginia compiled genealogies. Yes, that is a document you know that, that is, well, not a document. That is a document cache. It is available at LVA. So we're, a fortunate coincidence is that we are coming to the end of the time and we've come to the end of the questions, except Tim, there's a special request from you, for you. What is Louisa's story behind getting mm. expelled? Okay. Um. Juliet, who now went by the name of Milton, Juliet Milton, and Louisa Staling, and two other women, one named uh, Harriet, she did not have a, uh, she was not recorded with a surname, and a fourth woman, also named Juliet, but had a name of Wiggington, in, in August of 1867, at the church, they charged them with a charge of, quote unquote, fornication. That was typically uh, a charge for, for women that gave birth to children out of wedlock. Um, and we know that there were children of, of three of those uh, women um, that we, we have subsequent records of them. Those three were excluded from the church. Juliet Milton, she died as a result of childbirth one day before the church had their final meeting at which they declared uh, they had the, the final meeting on August the 10th. She had died on August the 9th and had, um, had uh, she had confessed to impropriety, if you want to call it that. Um, and um, we know that, know that this is true because there was a child born that took the name of Kilby, Elizabeth Kilby, born that same time in the same household where her other four children lived. 
So she likely died of childbirth and um, right before dying, uh, she was uh, not excluded from the church. Hmm. Thank you. So thank you very much to everybody who joined us this evening and the recording will be made available, the chat will be made available and the PowerPoints will be made available. So you'll have a lovely packet of goodies to uh, go through in the near future. And thank you so much Wait. to Karen and to Tim. Wait. Wait. Can Wait. I offer, I have three, Final comments after hearing the questions. Okay, sorry. Bring them on. All right. For African Americans, we have lost at least 10 generations of people that we cannot name and claim. So, this is really important to me. As you do your research, the point is that we must name them claim them. We must say their names. So that is one. Number two is that the European system of tracking families was patrilineal. For enslaved people, it was matrilineal because slaveholders wanted to claim the increase of their female slaves. So Prinny Thomas Jefferson actually made a formula for who do you invest in? You buy a feckin' woman and you count on her increase to increase your wealth. Okay? And he made a formula for that. So they changed the whole system of European patriarchy into a matriarchy. And that's part of the thing with the genealogy, with the DNA testing. Finally, I want to say, I am very proud to say I have been selected to be a keynote speaker for Roots Tech 2020. And I will be the big speaker for North America. And I have not quite framed what I'm going to say, but pretty, I might need to seek Haven in your house. <laughs> or Angela, maybe I'll come to you. But it is, this, these issues are becoming important. And I am so happy that people are looking back on the history and that Family Search is really trying to do this. Mm -hmm. to make us able to look at the past, face it as the truth, and make it an, an impetus for making a better society. And I'm off my soapbox, and thank you. Here, here. <laughs> okay, once again, Great. thank you to Sharon. <laughs> thank you to you Tim, Tim for a wonderful thing. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was wonderful. Love y'all. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everybody.